thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you who don't know, and I'm sure everybody does, Peggy is an international speaker. She's the author of two novels, uh, novels, sorry, two books, one of them <laughs> being Not Just Anatomy, in which we all know that term very, very well <laughs> in this group. Yes. Um, and uh, the training that you do is, is just incredible. So thank you for being part of our um, industry. It's such, it's so wonderful to have you and your voice. You are welcome. It is definitely my passion and something that I began years ago and it just has continued to grow. And it's wonderful to do what you love and knowing that you're making a difference for people. And I think that that in a nutshell is what assistants do yeah we well, make people's lives easier easier we help them yeah absolutely and that that goes into um, my first question for you the tips that you share on your um session today are just invaluable but what i find and i think a lot of assistants would attest to this is that we are people pleasers and we often yes. put, our, put ourselves very much <laughs> last and i think with a lot of the tips that you share it is about having a focus on yourself so I wondered if you could share any advice on how you can move from being kind of last in your own line to first. I truly believe that the only way to become the best assistant is to become the best you. When you grow and you continue to challenge yourself and you take on new things and you have a plan, then you can become the best you. So those tips that I shared about figuring out what you want and how you want to fill, creating that weekly plan, putting it on your calendar and beginning your day focused on you just for 10 minutes, just 10 minutes. I think that that can make all the difference. I know that when I supported executives, they were impressed that I had my own plan for my own life in addition to supporting them. It told them that I was future focused, that I wasn't just about the daily minutia. So I, I encourage you to, to take these steps to heart and to act on them. Yeah. One of the questions that we've had from Suzanne, and again, I think this is something that we all struggle with, is how you work out your true core values. Suzanne has said she's tried to do this before and ended up with a list of 20, <laughs> which probably oh, isn't. Gosh, yes. I think some of us have probably had more than that. So how do you whittle them down? <laughs> well, I actually have a worksheet that helps you do that. And so feel free to email me. I will send you that worksheet. I hear you in that you've had 20 core values because when you look at all those those different descriptions, you you want all of those in your life. But your values are what guide you to make your tough decisions. So for example, just recently, my husband um, wasn't feeling well. It was a trip to ER. He's fine now, so, so don't worry. But it was this trip to ER at 2 a.m. And we didn't know what was happening with him. You know, uh, I was very, very worried. That same day, I had a workshop that I had scheduled. It was um, a complimentary workshop on this same topic. And I used my core values to reach out to that group and I rescheduled it because I was using my core values and my core value of family needed to guide my decision to say, I'm not going to be able to do this today. Those tough decisions, it's the core values that get you through them. So you've got to narrow it down to five five core values so if you want to know how to do that reach out to me via email i'll send you my worksheet and be happy to answer any questions you have after you complete that that would be fantastic thank you and I, I hope your husband is okay now he is he is but it was a one of those scary moments no one likes to go to er at two in the morning yeah oh well as you said it's it's amazing where when you have those core values in place and you know your boundaries as well, it's, it's yes. easier to make those tough decisions. Prior to you joining us, we were talking about um, working with difficult executives. 
And I wanted to touch on that with you. I know I can ask you so many questions. Just You've got such a huge amount of knowledge. So I, I am going to fire a few random questions at you, if that's OK. Um, Absolutely. But we, <laughs> thank you. We were talking about um, how difficult it can be and how demoralising it can be to work with an executive who doesn't get the role. And I think it's difficult at the moment moving past that in a lot of ways when we all are working virtually and communication is the most important thing and it's harder than ever. So I mm -hmm. wondered if you had any tips around working with difficult bosses and then perhaps touching on boundaries and, and understanding your core values because I think the two go hand in hand. I agree. I agree, Nikki. And you know, the, the interesting thing about difficult bosses, difficult executives is if you replace the word difficult, if you use different, it will, it will change your mindset to be more open to who they are. Because if, if you're thinking difficult, it's negative. And when you're coming from a place of negativity, it's super hard to support someone. It can fringe on disrespect. And when you don't respect someone, it's super hard to support them. So I would encourage you to replace the word difficult with different. And then if somebody is different than you, what that means is you have to get to know them more in order to see them differently, in order for them to hear you. You need to learn how to speak their language. So I think about the different executives I've supported and you finally build up this great partnership and then they retire on you. And so then a new one comes along and then you have to rebuild that relationship. And the last person that I supported, he was much different than the person before. It wasn't a natural click. It took a lot of time. I had to figure him out. And once I did that, then he wasn't so difficult because I understood how he was wired. Once I understood how he was wired, he could start to hear me because I was speaking his language. I was coming from a place of his priorities, his concerns, his interest. And when I did that, that difficulty, that, that space between us, started to come together. And so I would encourage you to do that. The other thing I would encourage you to do is make sure that you have respect for yourself and respect for the profession. Because if you are in question, if you are in doubt about either of those things, your executive will know it. And when they know that you don't have respect for your role and respect for yourself, those boundaries and those conversations can get can get to a place where you're not going to be happy. So I would say to, to do that, one of the ways that you can increase your value to understand your value is by going through a series of questions to clarify your value. And if you need help with that, again, email me. I've got five questions that will help you to clarify that. And once you know that, you can come from a place of strength. Yeah, I completely agree with all of that. Um, as a, uh, to add to that, we also, I suggest to um, assistants is to understand themselves as well as much as working yes. on understanding your executive. One of the things I really try to encourage is assistants to take personality tests. And yes. if their executives have done the same, then compare and contrast and really start to understand them, their communication preferences. Um, so that, I mean, it's hard enough being on the same page with the with your family members, let alone your boss. So, I mean, it's half the time we're on a different book, let alone a different page. So yes. it's just understanding yes. their communication preferences and their personality types. Mm -hmm. I, I actually have a whole workshop on that, Nikki. I, I agree 100%. And yes, when you know yourself, so for example, if, if you're an expressive person, an expressive person is some, someone who's enthusiastic, who uses a lot of words, and you're supporting somebody who is a driver, who they are target focused. They're constantly focused on the goal. They're not focused on chit chat. So if you're the person who wants to say good morning and you wanna have a cup of coffee and you wanna chit chat with them, they're gonna be going, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you taking up my time? That small little thing that you're doing could be driving them nuts. And so, yes, Nikki is absolutely right. You've got to understand how you're wired, what your communication preferences are, and that of your executive to make sure that you're not doing something on a daily basis that is causing you not to have that powerful communication. 
Yeah. We also were touching on, go, talking about communication, we were also talking a lot around how to work with your executives remotely now. Um, mm -hmm. One of our attendees has just said it's so difficult for her to know when to push, when to hold back, when to offer a lot of information, when to just leave her executive to, to kind of get on with whatever he or she is doing and then not hear from them for a while and not be in the loop. Um, we've covered that a lot this year. I don't know if you've had that in your training as well. It's something that assistants, I think, have struggled with not having that everyday touch points with their executives. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you had any advice for our assistants who are struggling with, um, with that. Yes, that has come up a lot. And I think that it, it's part of communication, but I also think it's part of confidence. You know, I've been working remotely since far before the pandemic, um, before I became a full-time speaker. And so I, I was used to working remotely with my executive. He traveled a lot. And so we didn't see each other every day. Um, sometimes it would be um, maybe once a week if I was lucky. So I had his schedule and I knew when he was free. I knew when he had 15 minutes. I you know, had, had all of that insight. And so I would call him. I would just call him. Sometimes those calls were five minutes and I just would call him. Sometimes I would text beforehand, sometimes I wouldn't. We had a great partnership, so I didn't have to worry about that boundary. But you can text your executive and say, hey, I've got something I wanna talk to you for about five minutes. I see that your calendar's free. Is now a good time for you? Then make the phone call, be very clear, very concise. Executives like to um, make the most of their time. So make sure you're prepared for that call and then just tick off your three to five bullets about what you wanted to express. Now, if that wasn't a possibility, what I did is I had what I would call a daily meeting in an email. On the subject line would read daily meeting via email. And that would be very clear, very concise, again, three to five bullets where I could update him on the things that he had asked me to do that I knew were a top priority for him, just to ease his mind that they were, they, that they were finished. And then I might have a question or two or um, some insights that I knew that he would find interesting, valuable. So I would just say, um, you control the calendar, make sure you're on it, reach out. Don't hesitate. Don't wait for the invitation. Yeah, I could. Yeah, I completely agree. It's one of those things at the moment, isn't it? I think we tend to forget because our executives in the office pre-COVID seemed, you know, pushing the business forward, making decisions, and and they're floundering, and they don't have all of the answers like like the rest of us at the moment. I think that's it, that's hard to handle for an assistant. It's such a shift and such a pivot for so many of us. So one of the things mm -hmm. I've been saying as well is you know, give them smaller choices. So if they're struggling to delegate or they're not quite sure where to move forward, it's rather than saying, how can I help? It's, can I help with this or this? Um, I don't know if you uh, yes. agree with that, Peggy. Absolutely. I know that when I would send, you know, on those time frames when my executive was on travel, it might even be, you know, internationally where we're in different time zones and it's much more difficult to communicate. I learned um, by way of making a mistake that if I email my executive and I had three or four different topics and I had some detail that I needed to express, those emails would never get answered because they were too much. My executive, and again, learning this through communication with him, my executive would have preferred three separate emails. That way he could respond to the one that he was clear on, that he had made a decision on, he could follow up with me. The ones that were still outstanding he didn't want to go into this lengthy explanation of where we were at. So, um, yes, I would, I would pare it down as much as you possibly can. And again, this is based on communication preferences on personalities. So check in with your executive now and then and say, is the way that I'm communicating with you working for you? Just be open to it and ask the question, are my emails uh, clear and concise enough for you? Do, you, do I need to be more robust or do I need to be more concise? Just ask some quick questions. You know, one of, the, one of the favorite questions I love to ask is, based on how your calendar has been managed for this past week, what would you have preferred? What would you change? 
instead of instead of just saying you know are things okay because your executive your executive is uncomfortable giving you negative feedback you're there to support your executive so the last thing they want to do is upset you give them some easy questions that they can tell you honestly the answer to and you'll learn so much yeah it's that um problem that a lot of or challenges a lot of assistants have where we feel like we have to be on it all the time and perfect and asking questions <laughs> moves us away from that <laughs> but that's how you learn <laughs> and that's how you make sure exactly that you're doing, doing the right thing yeah absolutely. exactly and, and you know be careful um really think about your question because the way that you ask the question will also indicate to your executive if you're thinking strategic or not if your questions are always about the schedule if they're always about these small details versus high level, when you ask a high level question, they realize that you're in the strategic space. So make sure you're weaving those into. And you know, when it comes to being perfect, your your goal, your metric is progress, not perfectionism, because we're human beings. We cannot achieve per being perfect. You'll never get there. So instead of focusing on being perfect, Focus on progress, just a little bit of progress every single day. Measure who you were yesterday and what you did in in today. That is your goal. Mm. Yeah, and I, I always say authenticity is better than perfection. <laughs> oh, I, I love that, Nikki. <laughs> yes. Which allows room for a lot of mistakes to be made. <laughs> <laughs> it sure does. It sure does. It does. <laughs> and you know, we all make mistakes. Our executive makes mistakes. And I know that you've all heard this before. The key is to catch it, to own it, to learn from it, make it better, put systems into place so that you won't make the same mistake, and then share what you learned. Share what you learned with your executive, with your coworkers, and focus on what you learned. Because when you focus on your mistake, it can fill your mind with all this negativity and it can weigh you down. We're, and and most of us, you know, we just keep telling anybody who will listen to us about that mistake we made. Yeah. But if we switched it up to sharing what we learned from it, that would empower yourself and empower others. Focus on what you learn. Focus on the solutions. We all make mistakes. Yeah, I love that. It's so true, and it's 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 heartwarming in a sense, isn't it? That you know. We all feel like that, you know, from the very top level CEOs, um, you know, as I said, authenticity is uh, is where we want to be. Um, we've yes. got a quick question from Michelle. We've got a, about five minutes left, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back and see okay. if we've got any questions from our attendees. Michelle's asked, how do you approach the subject if you don't agree with your executive? <laughs> that's, that's, a, so, that's, a, that's a hard one. <laughs> I would say <clears throat> begin by asking questions to learn more. One of my favorite questions is to say, help me to understand where you're coming from. Now, really what you're saying is, are you kidding me? What? But it doesn't come across that way because you asked, help me to understand where you're coming from. Or you can say, that's interesting. Tell me more. Sometimes what you heard isn't the whole story. So you need to ask questions to understand more. If where your, your executive is coming from is completely off base, it's not aligned to the strategy, it's not aligned to their goals. I was listening to Nikki's session earlier about this topic. So if it's not aligned to where they're coming from, you can simply point out, help me to understand how this fits into the priority. If your executive is perhaps <clears throat> making a decision where one staff member is being favored over the other. If you have a great partnership with them, point it out. Now I've done this. I've done this, it is scary, but if you do it right, again, by asking questions, they'll appreciate that you held up the mirror and let them see it themselves. Yeah, it's, it's about confidence. You, as you said, isn't it? It's, a, uh, it's about uh, being confident in what your job involves and what your role is. And there is an element of the executive assistant role that's coaching and mentoring your executive. And that, yes. that's, that's a, 
it's a difficult place to be because I think for a lot of us it's it's that managerial level that you don't want to cross and you you know there's you know I'm your member of staff and I work um, for you not with you and it's getting over that mindset before you can part of your role is to mentor and be that open yes. open um, you know open door um, communication with your executive where you can have those honest conversations it is it is ultimately part of the role absolutely you know one of the things that I often say is that assistants are managers because we manage our executive and the beautiful thing is they don't even know it but that's what we're really doing we're managing not just their schedule or as you say in the UK not just their diary we're managing every component we're managing their deliverables. We're tracking what is done and what isn't done. We're managing the communication by monitoring the email. We're managing to make sure that they're meeting all their deadlines. We are managing our executive. And we're doing it very delicately because they are in that higher position. But that doesn't mean that we're not essential to them. We've got one last question, which I want to circle back with, which was from my session, but I'd, I'd love your thoughts on it, Peggy. And I, I spoke around managing trade-offs and thinking about what doesn't get done as well as what, uh, almost as much as what is getting done. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the questions that popped up from that was around managing trade-offs when you work with more than one executive when you when you're working with multiple executives. So I had a, a few a few thoughts on that, and then I'd love. Peggy, your advice. Um, the mm -hmm. first thing is is communication, and it has to be open between yourself and all of the executives that you work with, because ultimately you all should be working towards the same strategy and the same goals. So it's managing trade-offs and having those conversations with the executives so that they are aware that very much aware there is only one of you, and they need to manage. They almost you almost work need to work together as a team. So that they're not, so they're aware of each other's priorities and how that's impacting your work. So that's what I would say. Again, it, it's open communication. It's making sure that everybody is working together as a team. Because as I said, there is only one of you, and there is only so much time in the day, and they need to awesome. be aware of where you're being stretched and pulled. So that's what I I would say, Peggy. To bring you in, is there any additional tips you can give? I, I just want to back that up by saying that you are a team and if you can convince those two executives to meet once a week together with you, because then you can go over all of the workload, you can go over the outstanding priorities and you can simply say, what are your top three priorities for this week? And then you can say, okay, I can do this and I can do this. One of the favorite things I heard um, from someone years ago was instead of saying that you can't do something, you say, I'm not able to do this, but here's what I can do. And so I think having that um, tripod of all three of you talking together, that way each executive can see all the different priorities and how you're balancing it. So I would just add that on um, to what you advise, Nikki. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it's early there. I know what it's like to get up and at six o'clock in the morning and have to be on camera. <laughs> so, first of all, I really appreciate that. I know it's not easy. So thank you so much for that. You are most welcome. Thank, thank you, Nikki. It, it was wonderful to see you, to be able to see you live and um, if, if there's any questions that the assistants have that haven't been asked, just have them email me. I would be happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm.